get ready for the rare super blue moon. We have one of the best meteor showers of the year in the Perseids. Saturn reaches opposition and will be at its best for the year. Mercury reaches greatest eastern elongation and is a return of dark skies and the Milky Way to those at high latitudes of the northern hemisphere. Welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky for August 2023. And what better way to start the month than with a full moon on the first? And not just a full moon, but a supermoon. A supermoon is where a full moon occurs around the same time that the moon is close to lunar perigee, its closest distance to the Earth on its orbit. And as the moon is a little bit closer to Earth, it will appear slightly bigger and slightly brighter in the sky. Now, if you ask me, the difference to the naked eye is negligible, but who am I to care? People love supermoons and it encourages people to get out and enjoy the full moon, which I think is great. And what's better than having a supermoon this month? How about having two supermoons? So on the 30th into the 31st, there is another full moon. And in modern times, having a second full moon in a calendar month is known as a blue moon, although the original definition of a blue moon is the third full moon in a season that has four full moons, which is a bit rarer. But these days, the term is often used for the second full moon in a calendar month, so you can expect to see lots of headlines for a super blue moon and lots of clickbait articles sort of convincing people that the moon is actually going to turn blue when of course it's not. I recently shared a video about an app that I use to plan my moon photographs so do check that out if you haven't already so that you're ready for the two super moons this month. And the good news doesn't stop there. Now because we have a full moon at the start of the month and at the end of the month it means the new moon occurs in the middle of the month around the 16th which is perfectly timed for the Perseid meteor shower, one of the best of the year. In my opinion, it's the second best after the Geminids in December, but where the Perseids is better is that here in the Northern Hemisphere, it's summer, and so you can go out and enjoy some mild temperatures, maybe go to the beach with some friends and enjoy an incredible display of meteors. So the shower has been active for the past two weeks already, and it will continue to be active until about August the 25th, but there's a sharp peak of activity around August the 13th. So it might be the night of the 12th into the 13th, or it might be the night of the 13th into the 14th, depending on where you are in the world. And around the time of the peak, there's a maximum zenithly hour rate of between 100 and 150 meteors per hour. But don't expect to see that many meteors. That value is calculated for a pristine dark sky with zero light pollution, perfect weather, and for the whole sky above you when the radiant point is directly overhead. And in reality, a lot of the meteors will be too small for you to catch with the naked eye, and it's almost impossible for you to watch the entire sky uninterrupted for a long period of time. So if you're going to a dark rural site with not much light pollution, lower your expectations to about 20 to 40 meteors per hour. Another thing to note about the Perseids is that in the run up to the peak, there's a sort of steady increase of activity. Then there's a sharp peak around the 13th, which lasts for about a day or two. And then after the peak, meteor activity drops off significantly. Like it really just drops off. The radiant point of the meteor shower is of course within the constellation Perseus. And for those in the northern hemisphere, Perseus rises in the northeast in the late evening and climbs higher in the sky as you approach the dawn hours. The higher the radiant point is in the sky, the more likely you are to see meteors. And this is why it's best to watch the Perseids sort of between midnight and dawn in the morning. So the higher the radiant gets, the more meteors you're going to see. But don't be misled by mainstream media. You don't have to look in the direction of the radiant point. As long as the radiant point is in the sky, meteors will fall all over the sky. It's just that if you trace a line backwards from the path of every meteor, they all intersect at the same point known as the radiant point. But you don't have to face that direction. If you're in the southern hemisphere, the closer to the equator you are, the more chance you'll have of seeing meteors, but I would advise you guys to face sort of somewhat north to see more meteors. But with only a crescent moon rising in the early hours of the morning, conditions couldn't be much better, so don't miss the Perseid meteor shower this year. 
Now we still have the Milky Way core visible in the night sky and I'm sure those of you in the northern hemisphere at mid to high latitudes are going to be welcoming the return of darker skies this month and a better opportunity to capture the Milky Way. So for those in the northern hemisphere, the Milky Way core can be found in the south as darkness falls, but it'll begin to sink towards the southwestern horizon and set. And from there, you're left with the great rift of the Milky Way standing vertically against the western horizon, which I still think is a very photographic region of the Milky Way. In the southern hemisphere, the Milky Way core is very high overhead as darkness falls, but it does sink down towards the western horizon. There's a really nice opportunity for a Milky Way arch panorama. And then the Milky Way continues to sink lower to the horizon until the Milky Way band is parallel with the horizon, which provides a really interesting photographic opportunity. As for the planets this month, Mars and Mercury can be found low on the horizon in the evening twilight, but they might be quite difficult to spot. Mercury reaches greatest elongation on the 10th, which is its furthest distance from the sun in the sky for this apparition. The highlight of the month is Saturn, which reaches opposition on the 27th. This is where it is directly opposite the sun for us on Earth. So Saturn will rise in the east as the sun is setting in the west. It'll spend the entire night in the sky and then set in the west as the sun rises in the east. Now during opposition is when Saturn is at its closest point to Earth on its orbit. So even with a 600 millimeter lens, you can very easily make out the rings of Saturn because it's much closer and bigger in the sky. And because it's opposite the sun, it's at its brightest of the year, shining at magnitude 0 0.4. It's like the planetary version of a full moon. Talking of which, on the 30th of this month, Saturn will be right next to the full moon, the so-called super blue moon in the sky. Jupiter can be found rising in the east a couple of hours after Saturn. It's in front of the constellation Aquarius and shining at a bright magnitude of minus 2.5. And that's all I've got for you this, guys. Now on to the hashtag Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target subject or theme for people to photograph and then upload the images to Instagram or Twitter and I pick my favourite three for a prize. If you're uploading to Twitter or X, whatever it's bloody called these days, use the hashtag Wittens on your post. But if you're uploading to Instagram, please tag me on my new page at Wittens underscore Alan Wallace because the hashtag system no longer works over on Instagram. Hopefully I can use this page to notify you about night sky events and share all of your amazing images. Anyway, third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets, second place wins a Constellation hoodie, and first place wins a copy of my book Photographing the Night Sky. Last month's theme was Twilight, and here are the winners. In third place is this serene image of some noctilucent clouds above a lake captured by Daria. This image really makes me miss the countryside of Wales and those summer nights out hunting the noctilus and clouds. Just absolutely gorgeous. In second place was this super interesting image of what I'm assuming to be a SpaceX launch captured by Gary Revolt. The colours in this image are insane and I love those crepuscular rays forming from the exhaust clouds. Really impressive stuff. And in first place was Daniel Munoz with this image of the moon and a planet above the volcano Teide on Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Absolutely love the burning twilight colours in this and I love twilight for capturing the moon and the planets as they appear before the stars. It's their moment in the spotlight and Daniel has captured it wonderfully here. Next month, let's go with the Milky Way core. It's time for everybody's favourite, and now it's visible as soon as darkness falls, so there's no excuses. You can even be home in bed at a reasonable time. What are you most looking forward to this month? Let me know in the comments down below. Don't forget to follow my new page on Instagram, at Wittens underscore Alan Wallace. Hit subscribe if you haven't already, and check out my recent moon planning video so you're ready for the super moons this month. As always, if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.